I will deal with the next people. Okay, we're done. We're done. We're done. Today we're going to have like an email sign up sheet here. And so, Yes. Yes. Thank you. 
well, we will be on YouTube live, right? So we're yeah. out of the way. Yeah. 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 tonight. I also want to welcome those uh, who are watching this event on YouTube via the Open College Live Events channel. I'm Henrik Schatzinger and I'm the co-director of the Center for uh, Politics and the People. The Center was created to promote uh, constructive political discourse and foster 
uh, engagement of citizens. So that's the plan also for tonight. Today's event is sponsored by the CPP as well as the uh, Ribbon Commonwealth Press. Just like uh, two years ago when we co-sponsored a series of events with political candidates, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with the Commonwealth again uh, this year to set up these events, so thank you for that. Uh, one of the center's uh, assistants will pass around a sign-up sheet for, for emails if you're interested in hearing from us about upcoming events. You will also see uh, connect cards in, in front of you, and if you scan the QR code, it will take you to the CPP's website, which, encourage you, which, which will encourage you to connect with us via social media. We have started to share more articles via Facebook and, uh, and Twitter, and uh, a lot of people have uh, now followed us or liked us on Facebook, so you don't want to be left behind. Join us, and uh, we uh, will appreciate it if you, if you do that. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, candidate Dan Cole for Wisconsin 6th Congressional District, let me also mention that we certainly invited the incumbent Congressman Glenn Grothman for a debate tonight. Uh, we did go back and forth in terms of uh, dates and times, but the Grothman campaign told us that unfortunately uh, they cannot be here tonight <clears throat> or this fall because of scheduling conflicts. <laughs> Let me now turn to today's guest, Dan Cole. Dan Cole is a Wisconsin native, a 1987 graduate of Brown University, and he holds a law degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as a master's degree in history from UW-Milwaukee. After graduating law school, Cole worked in a variety of capacities uh, for the Milwaukee Bucks, including as assistant general manager. In 2009, he joined J Street, uh, the nation's largest uh, pro-Israel political action committee, as vice president of political affairs. In this role, he also worked closely with federal officials and congressional candidates on Middle East policy. Cole, Cole has also presented the Children's Hospital Association, as well as Major League Baseball. One focus of his has been the MLB's mental health initiative called Welcome Back Veterans. After some opening remarks by Dan Cole, we will have uh, Tim Like, uh, the editor of the Commonwealth Press, ask the candidate a few questions and then we will open it up to questions from you, the audience. Um, once we start asking these questions, uh, I will repeat them quickly, uh, briefly for our YouTube uh, viewers so it's easier for, uh, for them to follow. So please join me in welcoming Dan Paul. Well, thank you very much, Henrik. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I thank Ribbon College for providing this forum. This is what elections are all about, right? It's, it's taking a deep dive into the public policy issues that we face as a country. It's learning the different styles, the different approaches, the different priorities of candidates. So again, it is great to be here tonight. A special thanks goes out to all you Brewers fans. <laughs> for being here tonight. So, you know, it, if you sneak a peek at your cell phone, I, I won't hold it against you. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but thank you very much for being here. So, you heard a little bit about my professional background. So, yes, I am, I am Dan Cole. I am running for Congress here in the 6th Congressional District. As Henrik mentioned, I grew up in the district. My wife is Stacy. We've been married for 27 years. We have three kids, um, two of whom are, are college age, some of you may be curious in, in knowing, and, and, and they grew up in the district as well. Um, like many of you here, I have, I'm increasingly concerned about the direction of our country. I am, as every month goes by, I'm more and more concerned about the priorities that we see coming out of Washington, that we see coming out of this Congress. Um, this Congress, on the issue of health care, which I think is one of the fundamental challenges we face as a country, we don't see solutions, right? We, this Congress, um, my opponent, Glenn Grothman, he voted to take health coverage away from 44,000 of his constituents, to remo remove protections from people with pre-existing conditions, to impose an age tax 
on seniors for the health coverage that they have. So very, very concerned about that. Um, I'm concerned about the tax bill that has emerged from this Congress, <laughs> that where 83% of the benefits are going to the wealthiest 1%, corporations are, are getting a massive tax break, and our national debt has risen, is projected to rise by $2 trillion, and now Republicans are talking about taking a sledgehammer to Medicare and Social Security. So I think, you know, I'm concerned about priorities, which I think are misplaced. I think that there is a fundamental demand for a different kind of leadership, a different kind of representation across America and definitely in this district. So I am running, so I, I am running to serve my constituents, not special interests and not corporations. I am running to focus on the big problems that people face, like health care. You know, so no, I think that every single American should be able to get health care that is quality and affordable. That should go without saying, I think, in this country. We're the wealthiest country in the world, and health care shouldn't be a privilege. So I will fight tooth and nail in Congress to make sure that nobody with a pre-existing condition loses that coverage. I will fight tooth and nail to drive, you know, to drive down the cost of health care, and I will fight tooth and nail to reduce the exorbitant cost of prescription drugs that we that we face in this country. One of the things that I am calling for is to allow Medicare to negotiate to lower the cost of prescription drugs. I think that Americans in, in my age demographic, I'm 53 years old, should be able to buy into Medicare. I think that makes all all the sense in the world. And we need to do something about the monopoly power of big pharmaceutical companies that, you know, we see too much price gouging on life-saving drugs like EpiPens in this country, which is not acceptable. So I think Congress needs to hold big pharmaceutical companies accountable. They need to make sure that generic alternatives aren't blocked from coming onto market. And Congress needs to, you know, they, they need to do whatever they can to drive down those costs. Um, and one of those things is allowing Americans to import drugs from countries like Canada. Um, I, I will make sure that, that, Medi that Medicare and Social Security is not on the chopping block. Um, members of Congress, they talk about Medicare and so Social Security, they refer to them as entitlements. These, you know, these are hard-earned benefits. Americans spend decades and decades paying into the system with the expectation that these benefits will be there for them upon retirement. It, it, and now, what do you see Congress, what do you see Republicans doing? They're talking about paying for that, that massive tax giveaway uh, on the backs of hardworking Americans and hardworking seniors, as if it's their money to play around with. Um, it is not their money to play around with. It is all of your money. So I will fight tooth and nail to make sure that that doesn't happen in Congress. And I am running just based on the importance of new leadership. We need new leadership that will work across the aisle wherever we can to solve the big problems that we face as a country. We need new leaders who won't be rubber stamps for their party lead, for their party leaders, who will be there to serve their constituents and not just corporations and special interests. Um, you know, I am concerned about the partisanship and all the political fighting that we that we see in in Washington. I don't know how many of you know this, but Glenn Grofman is considered one of the very most partisan members in Congress. Matter of fact, when, when I decided to do this, he was considered the second most partisan member out of 435 members of the House of Representatives. That just runs afoul of the way we do things in Wisconsin, where there is give and take. Uh, you know, Stacy and I, we wouldn't have been married for 27 years if there wasn't compromise in our house. So we need a different approach. We need different kind of leaders. Um, we need representation that puts America above all else. Not, not loyalty to party, but loyalty to this great country of eyes. So I thank everyone for being here tonight, and I look forward to delving into the important issues at stake in this election. Thank you everyone very much.
Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Two housekeeping things. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cole, for your opening comments. Uh, I'm not the editor of the paper. We have a very fine editor of Ripon College alumnus, Ian Stapleton. And Ian is a much better journalist than me. So Ian is the editor, I'm the publisher. Um, and the second thing is, there will be a debate between uh, Congressman Glenn Grofman and um, Mr. Cole, Dan Cole. And that will be a week from tonight, from 7 to 8 p.m. It'll be on the radio. It'll be on 11.50 a.m., 103.5 FM, 106.3 FM. So that will be the one debate. It, it is. It, it's, a week, it's a week from yesterday. A week from yesterday. Yep. At 7 o'clock. <laughs> Don't believe me. It's fake news here. <laughs> um, secondly, uh, Congressman Grohlman uh, wanted us to tell you that he will be making an appearance in Ripon uh, a week from tomorrow. You can bet on that at 8.30 a.m. at Mud's Coffee. Um, so, with that, uh, Mr. Cole, we'll talk about some of the issues you brought up in your opening comments, but my first question to you is, you know the 6th District probably better than any of us in this room having campaigned here, and you know that this is traditionally a very Republican district. Do you know how long it's been since we've elected a Democrat to Congress? Uh, 54 years. John Race very was good. the last Democrat. And, was how, and how long did he serve? John Race served one term. He served one term. <laughs> so, and, and, he, and he won uh, when uh, Lyndon Johnson shellacked uh, uh, Senator Barry Goldwater. So, what makes you think that this year, the 6th District, and it's, by the way, it's, it's arguably more uh, Republican. That Barack Obama carried in 2008. Um, so, you know, I, it is a district that is Republican, but its history is, is moderate. Um, I think more moderate than the current congressman. Um, the other thing is, so as I, as I travel across this district, whether I go to Portage or Port Washington, whether I'm in Cedarburg or Sheboygan, um, Ripon or, or Oshkosh, wherever, wherever I go, healthcare is on everyone's minds. And I think people support the need to make sure that as a country, we have healthcare that everyone can access, everyone can afford. Um, there is a wide demand for new leadership. People, you know, for the mention, for the reasons that I mentioned, people are concerned about our broken democracy, about the influence that corporations have in our democracy that they exert over politicians. I think that Citizens United will go down in history in the annals as one of the most poorly decided and dangerous Supreme Courts on record. One of my early priorities in Congress will be shining a light on all the unseen money, the dark money in politics. So for all of those reasons, I think that people are people have important priorities that are unmet. People are looking for a different kind of leadership. People, you know, people are rightfully concerned about the state of our democracy right now. Thank you. Mr. Cole, you just mentioned uh, health care. Let's let's start off talking about that. Uh, Registration for the Affordable Care Act begins November 1. And uh, as you know, while the Senate was unable to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act, because one senator, I'm told, did this, told that through rallies, but um, the individual mandate has been done away with. And arguably, that's really the, the tool that was able to sustain it, because uh, through money requiring everyone to participate, those with greater needs were able to afford to have their needs taken care of. Now that that's gone, what would you suggest be done if you believe in the Affordable Care Act or some other sort of health care to make it sustainable? Right. So, you know, I, I think we have to stabilize the markets. And so, you know, I, I think that one there, there are some ideas that hopefully Republicans and Democrats can work together to help st stabilize the markets, to drive down the cost, reinsurance programs, are one step in, in that direction. But, you know, what we should be doing is working as a country, our elected officials, they should be looking to protect health care, right? To make sure that nobody loses their health coverage, not to drive up the cost for seniors, not to remove protections for pre-existing conditions. So that is what we've seen over the last couple years. It is more chaos, no solutions, um, and Americans, they are rightfully concerned, and I think healthcare has emerged as the top issue in this election for a, for a strong reason. 
You said that you would consider a number of options. Would you consider single payer? So I am not calling for single payer. Um, I, I do. I've stated the principle. I, I think that we should try to make sure that every American can get um, <coughs> affordable and quality coverage. We, you know, there are steps we can take to make sure that that happens. I talked about before that I support a Medicare buy-in for middle-aged Americans. Um, I think we need to know what the costs are for, for single payer, you know, is part of the discussion as we look to move forward. So more people do have health care, so we drive down the costs. Let's talk about costs. Um, you have said tonight a couple times, and you've said on the campaign, that it's very important that you protect Medicare and Social Security, you said tonight, from the sledgehammer of the Republicans. Um, and yet, arguably, people say those two programs are not sustainable. But you said you protect them for future generations. You've also said for future generations you would support uh, some sort of a subsidy for university and college students of low or moderate income. Those are two costly claims. How would you pay for them? And how would you address as you mentioned, the $21 trillion uh, debt that is continually growing. Right, right. well, you know what? What I would start by doing is just reassessing this tax cut, right? We need, we need, you know, we need a tax system where everyone pays their fair share, including the most well-off in this country. Well, what have we seen by this as a result of this tax bill? We've seen, I mentioned before, it's created an additional Two trillion dollars of national debt—that is, you know, that is unacceptable. And I, I don't. I think it's, you know, I think it's outrageous the notion that seniors, that their Medicare and their Social Security would be jeopardized by this tax bill. So, you know, we we need a, like I said, we need a tax system that is sustainable, where everyone pays their fair share, particularly corporations. And the most wealthy, you know, I I'm a I'm a pro business, pro opportunity Democrat, but I'm not naive enough to think if we just hand the keys over to business that higher wages, you know, if we if we massively cut their taxes, that higher wages are automatically going to follow. I, I I don't think that that's the case. So there's a role for government, right? I think that government should be prioritizing programs that will invest in the future of America. One of those, one of those things, so we're, we're at Ripping College, is education, right? Our government, we should be doing things where we value teachers, where we're making sure that students, that young people have the skills that they will need to succeed and flourish, whether they go to four-year college or they go to tech schools or they directly enter the workforce. I think that infrastructure is another unmet opportunity you know, we, we live in a you know we live in the world's wealthiest country, yet you know our our roads and our bridges are are falling into a sorry state of disrepair. So we need to invest in programs that will offer a promising return on investment. Um, I don't think we're doing enough of that right now, Tim. If I may follow up with the question that I asked, the second part of it, uh, some claim we have a government right now we can't afford. Is to say every year we have a deficit and the debt continues to mount despite the promises of well meaning politicians who go to Washington and intend to make cuts or grow revenue, but still, uh, as you pointed out, our, our, our debt is well on the way to reaching that 22, 22 trillion. What hard decisions would you make to address that issue? Or does it matter? Will we grow ourselves out of that debt? No, it, it, it does matter. It does matter. So. One hard decision is, like I said, reassessing our, our tax system so everyone pays their fair share. You know, I, I, I think that Democrats and Republicans, they need, to, they need to get together and have a discussion and talk about things. You know, the Senate a number of years ago, Simpson Bowles, they were having those discussions. Um, you know, I, we, we have a problem in our country where one side, you know, they, they don't consider the other side's idea, right? So to me, it shouldn't matter whether it's a Democratic idea or a Republican idea. Everything should be on the table, you know, for discussion no matter where it comes from. 
Thank you. If, if elected, uh, you said you would promote the purchase of products made in America. And that's actually a position that's been uh, put forth by President Trump and uh, Senator Baldwin. Yet you've also said, and I'll quote here, you'll fight for fair trade policies so Wisconsin's industries and workers are guaranteed a level playing field. How can you support fair trade globally while advocating for protection, protectionism or at least favoritism nationally? Um, you know, I, I, I think that we, there, in Wisconsin, we, right now, by the way, we're going through a trade war, right? Where Wisconsin dairy farmers, where Wisconsin manufacturers, Wisconsin workers, Wisconsin consumers are feeling a world of hurt um, as a result of this self-created trade war. So we need smart and fair trade policies that unrig the system against workers. We, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, that, that, pro that Wisconsin farmers, that Wisconsin manufacturers can get their goods to market, you know, in, in a fair way. But I, you know, I, I do, I do think we should make sure that we buy American. For instance, I talked a little bit before about infrastructure. I think in any infrastructure plan, we should prioritize, you know, buying American steel. Steel. So I don't think it's an either or, Tim. I think we can do both things to make sure that we have smart trade policies and, at the same time, our fair trade policies. Okay, thank you. And one last question, if I may, and that is, um, you had made the comment that to succeed in Washington, you were going to need to reach across the aisle. That is to say, Republicans and Democrats, we need to work together, sort of like Simpson Bowles. Uh, can you identify an area or some public policy positions in which you deviate from traditional Democrat uh, orthodoxy? Um, you know, so I don't know what democratic orthodoxy is all, all the time, but I can tell you areas that I think that Democrats and Republicans can work together. Um, we need to make sure, you know, and Henrik talked about my work for veterans returning with PTSD. We need to make sure that veterans get treated for their hidden wounds of war wherever and whenever they need that, whether, whether it's in the VA or whether it's through telehealth in other areas. I would like to think, given the opioid emergency that we face in this country, that Democrats and Republicans will work together, and so I think that's another another opportunity. Workforce training, um, which in the president, um, President Trump, prioritized. I, I don't think that this Congress is doing enough in that regard. So there, are, there, you know, there are a number of things. You know, uh, Donald Trump, he ran on the promise that people wouldn't lose Medicare. I would like to help the president achieve that promise. Mr. Cole, Frank, thank you for answering my questions and uh, look forward to hearing your answers to some better questions from out there. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tim. With that being said, uh, I want to open it up to, to you, the audience, uh, and we don't filter questions, uh, anybody can ask whatever they really wish to wish to ask, uh, however, the only rule that I would say uh, I encourage you to follow is to keep the, the, the questions fairly short, we don't want to have really uh, very long statements, uh, and so, with that being said, uh, who has questions? There was a hand uh, immediately in the back. Hi Dan, this is Jay Graff from Walt Pond. Uh, one of my major concerns, I've studied history very much in depth, one of my greatest concerns that I think our country is facing that is creating a lot of the problems that you spoke about was market monopolization. Healthcare, for instance, when a, one of the greatest advantages to having a monopoly is that you can drive prices to your consumers and vendors. And we've all heard the stories where the CEO said of a, of a pharmaceutical issue, that, or a pharmaceutical uh, supply company, that said, it's, I have a moral right or I have a moral obligation to charge as much for what for my product as I possibly can. And I think this is rampant across everything, every particular industry, banking industry, the agricultural business, the disconnect between the differences between big and small business. And then you roll on top of that the, the hyper gerrymandering and hyper partisanship 
that and that's created such a political divide. How, how do you pri where are your priorities? I spent 25 years in the military, and the first thing you do is uh, you get your great big pile of work you have to do, and you prioritize it right at the top. And I'm still not sold on whether or not it's the, the political disconnection with the big money, or if it's a market monopolization. And even history shows us that uh, post the antitrust legislation that was in, put in place and the, the injection of social programs, socialistic programs into a capitalist-based economy, saw even the wealthiest people, the Rockefellers, J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, saw a, a greater expanse of their wealth, where they were better off owning a smaller portion of a healthy economy than a large portion of unhealthy. I just like your take on that. Um, so there's a lot to unpack in, in that question. It's a good question, but there's a, there's a lot there. And if you don't mind, uh, we need to always kind of repeat for, for our YouTube viewers what the question was. I, you're right, there are a lot of things going on in the, in, in the statement itself. The first aspect was really about market monopolies, and uh, we could look at uh, you know, the healthcare industry and, uh, and drug and drug prices as, a, as an example where you know, companies uh, also have to admit spend a lot of time you know, researching a lot of you know R and D into these into these uh, drugs. Having said that, how do we kind of ensure fair sort of prices for for consumers? As, as one example, and the other question was more about priorities, uh, and especially in this sort of political divided climate. And I'll take it from there. Right. Um, you know. So speaking of my priorities in in Congress. So one of my big priorities is just reforming the system, for lack of a better word draining the swamp. Um, so, you know, last week we actually unveiled our reform agenda. And so it starts with, you know, curbing the abuses that we've seen as a result of Citizens United. So I think we need to shine a bright spotlight on all the dark money that is funding our elections, right? We need to know who these donors are to these outside groups who are spending so much to influence our elections. When I do a commercial, I have to say I'm, I'm Dan Cole and I approve this message. Unfortunately, these outside groups, you know, there is not the there's not the accountability that we need that is so damaging to our democracy. I am also running on a term limits pledge, so I will not serve more than eight years in Congress. I think the term limits would go a long way toward making Congress more accountable so people go to Washington and they're there to make a difference, not to please their party leaders, and then they come home and it's somebody else's turn to serve. Um, I think that we need disclosure, right? So members of Congress, they should publish their calendars so constituents know what their members of Congress are up to on a, on a daily basis. So those are the, 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 among the things that I would Prioritize um, the, Disclo the, the Disclose Act is geared towards curbing the abuses we've seen from Citizens United. To your other question, yeah, we do have far too much monopoly power. Um, we see it with big pharmaceutical companies and the way that they are willing to jack up the cost of life-saving drugs. And Congress needs to act. They need to hold drug companies accountable. Right, so when they jack up the prices, Congress, they need to make sure that generic alternatives come on the market. Um, Congress, when they, when they use their monopoly power, one of the solutions is for Congress to allow Americans to import drugs from safe countries like Canada. So that gets at a, a lot that you're talking about, but remember it was the Republicans, it was Teddy Roosevelt, who were the original trust busters who understood the abuses of, of monopolies in this country and also the dangers of, of just wealth disparities which are growing and growing in this country as well at historic levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just one brief comment. Uh, you have mentioned uh, dark money in uh, American politics and so I will use it as a chance to plug our next event which actually will be on October 30th. Uh, it's a, it's a Tuesday after fall break at 5 p.m. We're going to uh, watch uh, a documentary entitled Dark Money. 
uh, in the Heritage Room in the Commons at 5 o'clock. Uh, and everyone is invited, of course, to join us. We'll have a discussion about um, the influence and uh, of, of dark money. So much uh, for that. Um, now the next questions. Uh, I'm, yeah, um, Julie. <laughs> I'm very concerned about international relations. Under the current administration and the current congressional leadership, our, our international relations have, are deteriorating. And I think that um, my, our greatest concern is that our um, longtime allies and the UN um, are not seeing us as, as good international citizens any longer. So my question is, what do you think needs to be done or can be done to move us back to the point where we are good citizens internationally and not bad players, worshiping dictators? Uh, thanks for that question, Judy. I am also concerned about American global leadership. You know, I, my background, um, Henrik mentioned that I work for an organization called J Street. J Street's priority is American diplomacy. Um, its mission is Middle East peace. So America, we can't just lead with our might. We have to lead with our moral authority. I am concerned that we are cozying up to countries like Russia, um, the Saudis. We see what's going on right now with Jamal Khashoggi. Um, there are huge areas of concern, and we are, you know, we're not standing up for our NATO alliance. We are undermining our, our closest friends. So we need, a, we, need a, we need a different kind of trajectory. I, you know, di diplomacy, it is about, you know, they talk about soft power. And so for us to achieve our objectives in the world, we do have to lead with our moral authority which I am very fearful that it is getting undermined. Okay, let's go to the next uh, question, Kurt. Um, I have a simple question, but it's gonna be difficult. <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking at um, importing pharmaceuticals, what role do you see that the FDA would have, and what about consumer protection? I mean, I remember a couple years ago, um, problems with uh, dog food from China. You know, so you know, how would that, I mean, I, not to say it's a, it's a bad idea, I think it's a great idea, but how do we maintain consumer protection? It, has anyone addressed that? Right. Well, so the question was, again, just to, uh, what can we do to import uh, from, you know, drugs from other countries, but at the same time, how do we deal with the, with the difficulties surrounding that? So, um, so absolutely, we need to make sure that imported drugs meet the safety standards that we demand as a country. That's why you know, we have to be very careful how we do it. I talked about safe countries like Canada, um, where we should start allowing Americans to import drugs. But it's not an either or. There's a, we, need, we need the FDA. We need to make sure that the drugs meet the important consumer standards that we have in place for a reason. Other questions? It's always good to have student questions. Uh, Eugene. Can I borrow your microphone? Okay. Hold it closer. Yeah, got it. Um, Mr. Coles, I think that we all have listened to what you have to offer, your reforms are sound, and that your concerns about our state in international relations um, are justified. Well, but if we go back to the basic, if you want to pass anything, if you want to have anything implemented in America at all, you need to vote. And Congress is going to be the one deciding that. Right now, Republicans hold the majority within Congress. And so if you're elected, and many more Democrats will get elected this season too, I hope, you will still have to work across the aisle, which is exactly what you plan to do. Um, the problem, though, is bipartisanship, as we all say. Um, we all float around with that idea, but it's real and it's serious. So, what exactly do you want to do? What can, what do you want to do in particular to fix this kind of political environment that has long so degenerated into so heavy tribalism like that? So, so the question is, given all the partisanship and the gridlock that we face, 
how can I be a difference maker in that regard? Um, you, you know, so I, I think that it's important that elected officials aren't just rubber stamps for their parties. I, I've made it clear that I think it's time for new leadership in the Democratic Party. I, you know, I would not support Nancy Pelosi. That would be my first vote as a member of Congress. So, you know, you need to buck your party when, when you feel you have to. And you need to work across the aisle. I, I, you know, we would, that question came up before some of the areas that I would like to, that I would, that I see huge room for bipartisanship. So protecting our veterans, making sure that we have um, a strong infrastructure initiative in the country. Uh, workforce training is another area for, for bipartisanship. But you have to be able to have discussions, right? In, in the old Washington, Democrats and Republicans, they would break bread. They, you know, they had much more opportunities to socialize. Um, there is a caucus in Washington. They're called the Problem Solvers. So there are a couple dozen members um, on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, who do get together and they talk about challenging issues like healthcare, like infrastructure. So that is the kind of niche that I would certainly look to serve. In Washington. Thank you. Uh, more questions. Uh, <laughs> where did we go? Yeah. This isn't even an education question. It's different. Yeah. Um, your district, our district, borders Lake Michigan, or most, I think, all of the district. We know what's happened with the EPA. We know that so many of the tributaries that go into Lake Michigan are in our district. How or what would you do to try to restore the control of what's being taken out of our water, the control of our streams, and what's going to happen with Lake Michigan? So yeah, the question is primarily about really water quality and what can we do to kind of ensure the safety and quality. Right, so this district, we have 75 miles of Lake Michigan coastal treasure, I would say. You know, so many freshwater bodies as well, inland lakes. So this is a state, I don't care if you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, you're an independent. We have a proud conservation tradition. People are rightfully concerned that they are going to have a safe drinking supply, that we're going to have clean air as well. So we need to protect our coastal treasures. The Great Lakes are responsible for, you know, for over 20% of the world's freshwater drinking supply. So this is our, you know, this is our treasure that we have to safeguard, not just for our region, but for the world. That, you know, we've, we've had, there's so much more we can do. You talked about the tributaries, and we have had a host of invasive species that have changed the ecosystem in the Great Lakes. Um, we, in the, as far as the inland lakes, so many are being threatened by high capacity drills. We need to take a close eye at what's happening in, in that regard, as far as lakes getting drained. And then our freshwater supply is getting contaminated by CAFOs, by these feedlots. So again, it is not a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It is a moral issue to protect our drinking water to make sure that our, our air is safe, um, and also to take um, climate change seriously. Okay, there was a question over here. This relates back to uh, corporate influence in the government's monopoly power. I think it's a fun one. Um, so when the lights went out in Puerto Rico, certain private energy companies stepped in to <coughs> turn them back. Tesla has been able to drive down the price of electric cars more than any government program probably could. Domino's will come to your house and pave the road so that it makes its pizza delivery more efficient. I don't know if you see commercials about that. My question is, this seems like an interesting way for corporate influence to benefit the American public without costing the government a great deal of money. Do you think it's wise, or it would be wise, for the government to incentivize those kinds of programs? Or do you think that's a dangerous path to lockdown? So, the 
question is really about uh, government incentives when it comes to innovative uh, companies who really want to uh, benefit the public good, right? Uh, what, what can be done to foster this kind of culture? Um, so I, I think that the government has a huge role to play here. The government should be incentivizing entrepreneurial opportunities. Here in Wisconsin, we lag at the bottom of the 50 states in terms of startups. Think if, think if the government were in incentivizing clean energy initiatives, wind and solar. It's not just safeguarding our planet, it is creating high paying jobs. Something that I think will keep more young people here in our communities and another challenge that we have in Wisconsin is that you know we don't you know too many young people they don't come back when they when they go away, so I've, absolutely thank you for that question. Government definitely has a role to play here. Yeah, right here. <coughs> thank you for being here tonight, Mr. Paul. I'm Ken Fulberg. I've been a certified public accountant for over thirty years. I'd like to take about twenty seconds to frame my question, and then I'll have the one question at the end, in which I wish your opponent was here to answer the question as well. Our debt in America, as mentioned earlier, was $20 million on January 20th, 19, 2017. It's now over $21 trillion. With the 2019 budget proposal, it will climb another $7 trillion by the end of 2020. 30% of that debt is currently held by China and other foreign governments. Interest we have to pay on our debt is now $363 billion which is already more than half of what we spend on the entire Medicare program. I'm alarmed, as you can tell by my tone of voice, by the financial irresponsibility demonstrated by Congress and the current and two prior administrations. Economic growth at the current 2.4 to 2.9 percent rate, or even a 5 percent rate, isn't nearly enough to get us anywhere close to a balanced budget where our spending would not exceed our income. Severe drops in our standard of living and social upheaval is predicted if the financial irresponsibility isn't corrected at the national level. Again, I, I wish I could address this question to your opponent as well, since he's in Congress and has been for a while, but specifically, which programs would you propose cutting, or which taxes would you propose creating or increasing, and by how much money, to bring financial responsibility back to our American government? Thank you. Okay. So the question is about uh, how can we restore fiscal sanity, kind of, you know, uh, use a little more dramatic word here. But specifically, as we have heard earlier, the question is really about specific programs that need to be cut, hard choices have to be made at the same time um, in terms of raising revenue. How would you go about that? Right, right. So, you know, this has been a, fe a long festering problem. I, I do think that this Congress, this administration, has forfeited any claim for being fiscally responsible. I talked before about the tax bill, and I, I guess I would amplify on my remarks before about the tax bill, about the kind of tax code I think we should have as a country where everyone pays their fair share. Um, what, you know, the estate tax, they, they've actually made it more generous for wealthy heirs. They've doubled it, made it doubly beneficial for the wealthiest Americans. $22 million exclusion. Exactly. They didn't close loopholes for hedge fund managers, the carried interest loophole um, that they promised to do. So we need, you know, we need, we need to, we need to revisit the way that we have a tax code so it is more sustainable, so we can pay for all the programs that we want that we enjoy as Americans, that we value as Americans. But you know. I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned by the steps backward that we have taken as a country um, over the last couple of years, the signals that it, that it sends with a tax code that frankly benefits wealth and serves corporations rather than hardworking families. Um, I guess the other thing I would amplify are some of the remarks I made before about programs where we invest in things that have a strong return of investment where it is prioritizing programs and investing in our future. So I think that starts with education, making sure that we value teachers, making sure that young people have the critical thinking skills they need, that they have the tech skills 
that they, you know, that when they enter the workforce, they have the skills that they need to compete in this 21st century economy. I think infrastructure also carries an enormous return on investment. Companies, they can't, you know, they, their goods, they can't go to market unless they have, unless they have an infrastructure system that will carry it out. I think broadband is another thing that we should be investing on to make sure that our next generation of startup entrepreneurs, no matter where they live, can access internet that is high speed. So those are some of the programs that I would be prioritizing, and that's the kind of responsible, fiscally responsible tax code that I think we should move toward. Thank you. Maybe I'll just follow up, you know, a small question. Uh, a big part of discretionary spending is military spending. Do you think the defense budget at its current levels is uh, appropriate? You know, I, I'm, I'm concerned that our, the expenditures that we have on defense and the expenditures that we have on domestic needs are getting increasingly out of whack. Um, Eric. As you probably know, there's been a considerable downgrading of the role of science in the current administration so that decisions are being made primarily on political considerations, and so are appointments. Um, there's plenty of examples. Do you see any role in Congress for reversing this trend? Because these are, of course, largely through discretionary appointments or, and or arbitrary actions uh, within um, the executive branch of government. Now, can you speak to the role of science in policy making? Right. Well, you know what? We should value science. I, I briefly mentioned climate change. So the science on climate change is clear. It's one of the fundamental challenges that we face as not just a, a country, but a, as a world. I was very concerned that this administration pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Right. This was a result of smart, hard-headed diplomacy where you know, the whole world agreed to non-binding protocols, and we pulled out and we found ourselves in the company of Syria and Venezuela, and yet they've actually re-entered the accord, so it's just us. So I think Congress, we need to, <coughs> members of Congress need to speak out and say, listen to the science. Every single week, every single month, we seem to have a new storm of the century, and I, I think that there's probably definitely a, a link between that our military, right? They call climate change a fundamental national security challenge. Um, you know, Congress needs to be backing our Department of Defense when they, you know, when they make those claims. We should be looking, we should be listening to experts when we have discussions on health care. I think that, you know, the, the efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act, the process was short-circuited where we didn't have the, the normal debate process where independent experts weren't allowed to testify on the projected cost. So absolutely, there is a huge role for Congress to reassert its role in those kinds of things. I believe there was earlier a question in the back. I didn't know, okay. Uh, but here is a question, Gary. You're running as a Democrat. Most of the people in the 6th Congressional District work in agriculture or manufacturing. My uh, association with the Demo Democratic Party seems to be that it's the party of teachers and professional people that aren't making so much money. And I heard a person on the radio the other day say that uh, he said he was working like in logging or mining and he didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left him. What would you do to bring people who get dirty at work back into the Democratic Party? Yeah, can you speak to the changing constituency of the Democratic Party and maybe how it has changed and also how those who the party has lost, how can they uh, be brought back into the fold? So it's alarming when you look at the congressional map. You look at the United States and you look at where members of Congress are serving, and, you know, it's. Not, not enough places in the Midwest, in the heartland, where traditionally Democrats were well represented. So I, you know, I think historically we have been the party of working families, 
you know, we, so what we need to do is we need to champion the concerns that are on the, on the minds of working families. Healthcare, right? Making sure that we have healthcare that's quality and affordable. That, that, is, a, a, that, that is fundamentally important. We need to make it clear that we are fighting for an economy that works for everyone, not just for corporations, not just those at the, at the very top. Um, that's the kind of member of Congress I certainly would be. I, you know, I, we have, you know, in, in, in Wisconsin we have a, pro, you know, we have a proud tradition of progressivism in, in this state. We've had, you know, La Follette, the original fighting Bob La Follette. He was a Republican, right? So there are concerns that people have had through the decades that we shouldn't necessarily just look at through a Democratic or a Republican prism. It's a it's a prism of making sure that we are focused on the big problems that, that families face. I think that's 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 the path to having more Democrats in Congress in areas like the Midwest. <clears throat> Laura, um, I've got two questions and a comment. First of all, your your um, the incumbent consider continues to. Um, go after J Street and say it's a big lobbying firm and you say it's a firm that, you know, with a Middle East piece. Please tell us, you know, what it is it really does. I assume you'd be the best expert on that. And then what committee or committees would you like to serve on in Congress? And finally, as a woman who is over 65, don't bash Nancy Pelosi. She's <coughs> one of our sisters. And we look at her, not her policies, but her energy and her ability to continue to contribute. So be a little careful. <laughs> so, so the first question was about J Street. Yes. Second question was about committees. Yes. And then the third question is about. No question. It was a comment. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll address that a little bit too. Um, so J Street was created um, to prioritize American diplomacy and Middle East peace. I was a vice president there. Um, J Street has a you know they have a support network around the country. Um, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a political organization. I was proud to work there. I, I, I talked before about the role of, Amer of diplomacy in America. Um, you know, I, I think it's fund fundamentally important for the future of Israel to be a country that is both Jewish and democratic. And I think that is the only way to achieve that is through a two-state solution. So that was J Street's mission. That's what, that's what I was focused on. Um, committees. So I would certainly want to be on a committee that deals with healthcare. There are a few in that area. I would certainly be interested in serving on the education and workforce committee. Um, I do have a background in, in foreign affairs. So foreign affairs is another area. And I am also interested in serving the Transportation Committee in Congress. And, it, and, and the other question, you know what, I, I do, we have change coming on the Republican side, and I think America is looking to see a change of leadership on the Democratic side as well. So I, I think it's important for making Congress work together, function a little bit better, is to have a change of leadership on both sides. Just a brief follow-up question. You mentioned leadership changes. Uh, are there any names specifically that you would like to see rise in the Democratic Party? I would like to see what my choices are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, there's another question. Uh, yes, uh, Dan, you said you are not calling for single payer, but every industrialized country has universal health care. What are your objections to single payer? So, so the question is um, single payer and universal health care. So single payer, by the way, universal health care is the principle, and the principle is that every American should have health care that's quality and affordable. Um, what we need to talk about are the feasible steps and pathways that will move us towards universal coverage. Um, I'm concerned about the cost of, of single payer. We, we need to know exactly what we're talking about before we impose you know, higher costs, higher taxes on middle class families. So let's have a discussion and let's, let's air that. 
We also live in a, we live in a country where people like their employer provided health care. So, you know, uh, Americans are, you know, are, are looking to keep their employer provided health care. Um, but things are changing, right? We live in a gig economy where a lot of Americans, they don't stay in one profession with one employer for decades and decades and decades, the way that Americans used to. So I think we have to talk about making healthcare benefits portable to meet the needs of a more flexible workforce. Uh, yes, you know, you mentioned the cost of this, and Henry was the only one just lately who has brought up the cost of our military. You have not mentioned that at all. Is that, is that not a factor? Well, I, I said before that I'm concerned that, that domestic and military spending is growing more and more out, out of whack. That's so, mm -hmm. uh, we have time for maybe two or three more questions. I want uh, those who haven't spoken yet to give the first uh, priority. Uh, Betty. Uh, in listening to the words that have been used so far, I have not heard the word immigrants. <laughs> Could you address what you would work on or feel about immigrants into the United States. And maybe just to uh, make it you know, more specific, I would be you know, glad to hear more about A, what to do with those who are here um, undocumented, uh, but also, of course, uh, what about the legal immigration system? Um, we have, uh, you know, your, your opponent uh, is proposing uh, a bill according to which legal immigrants, like myself, would not be eligible to receive um, welfare benefits, uh, un in including Medicare and other, other programs, unless I become a U.S. citizen and others, right? But it's a very highly complex system, as we know. But maybe there are some pillars that you would like to see uh, changed. Right, so, listen, we're a country of immigrants. My, my grandfather, Max Cole, he came to this country in 1924, he was 23 years old. He came, you know, right when the gates to immigrants from Eastern Europe were closing. He didn't speak English. He didn't have a formal education. He didn't have immediate relatives here in the United States. So this current administration, they wouldn't have let my grandfather into this country. Um, you know, so we, you know, and, and I, everyone in this room, I'm sure we have our own immigrant story. We all have, you know, it's the allure of America that has been the promise that has brought immigrants to this wonderful country from all corners of the earth for, for decades and decades and decades. So I believe that we can have an immigration system that secures the border, that provides employers with the workforce that they need, and that is in keeping with who we are as a country. So, you know, I think that we should have a pathway to citizenship for young people who came to this country, whose parents brought them here. Um, I, we absolutely shouldn't be in the business of ripping children from their parents' arms. I think that's disgraceful. Uh, and you know what? And Democrats and Republicans, they need to come together and take steps to move towards comprehensive bipartisan immigration reform that's something that Glenn Grothman is simply unwilling to do. Thank you. And uh, if I may, just one quick follow-up question. Traditionally, America has favored family-based immigration and a family re reunification, um, which is often, you know, the term chain migration is used these days. Uh, at the same time, the current administration and these sort of members advocate more for employment-based immigration. You mentioned sort of skill-based immigration. Do you think that sort of ratio should should change to a certain degree? Um, you know, there are a lot of complicated issues like this. I, you know, I, I think our our country we should be looking to we shouldn't be looking to split families apart. That should be one of the guiding principles that we have. I think we have time for really for one or maybe maximum two. There's one more question in the back. Dan J. Graff again. Uh, so many of the issues that you talked about interconnect with each other in some form. Anything from national security to healthcare. Everything
everything seems to always come back to me to the destruction of the middle class. You know, a real good way to raise more money in the economy is to increase the average income. If the average income increases substantially every year faster than the cost of living, you're going to create more wealth in the middle class. In conjunction with that, addressing the market monopolization, and if you look at the structure of uh, how to create health care that's offered by employers, which has historically been the best health insurance on the market, then we're always negotiated by labor unions. Uh, a prevailing wage is negotiated and established by the presence of labor unions. Labor unions maxed out their presence in our market in 1967, represented 40% of the workforce. Right to work states, long time right to work states, see a labor union representation of three to five percent at, at the highest. And nationally, we're down to right around 20 percent, I believe. So all these issues connect together. And even the, the, the health care issue, the pharmaceuticals, instead of buying from Canada, if we enacted antitrust legislation, we'd be buying from American companies, just smaller American companies with more competition. And, and I guess your take, I, I'm interested in your take on the value of how to create and strengthen the middle class, given those known historical facts. Okay, very briefly, how do we strengthen the middle class? Well, a lot of very informed and intelligent questions tonight. Thank you for that, Jay. Oh, man, how, how to strengthen the middle, middle class? You, you know, I, I think there is a correlation between um, what's going on in, with the labor movement and the stagnancy that we've seen in wages in, in this country, there's a strong correlation. So I, you know, I, I strongly support the ability of labor to organize and bargain. Um, you know, Glenn, Glenn Grothman does not. I strongly, suppose, I strongly support Davis-Bacon, which is the prevailing wage law. Um, it should be a given that workers who work overtime hours can get time and a half. That's not something that Glenn Grothman agrees with. So we, you know, so we need, you know, we need labor and business to work together. That's something that I believe strongly in. We need, you know, we need to make sure that we incentivize companies to invest in their workers. I think that's another. That's something that our our tax code. Could do a much better job of to invest in in companies and to invest in in wage growth. Um, we need to ra we need to raise the federal minimum wage. For for almost ten years now, it's been stuck at seven dollars and twenty five cents. That is, you know, nobody can come close to making ends meet um, at, at at that at that level. So that needs to that needs to rise significantly. And then we need to, you know, we need to invest in our workforce. We need to make sure that people have the skills where they, where, you know, where they can be productive workers, where they're in a position to have, you know, strong middle class wages. So it's, it's, that's a complicated question and there's a lot of pieces to it, but it's one of the challenges that we face, which is the, the flattening of the middle class in America. This will be the last, uh, the last question. There is uh, someone who hasn't talked yet. Uh, I have a question about term limits, which I think are great. But isn't it a fact that if you serve one term in Congress or you serve 15 terms in Congress, you get your health benefits forever? It, shouldn't it be the same as if you left your job or were fired from your job that you would have to get off the health program, and wouldn't that save a lot of money? Yeah, can you speak to the health care benefits members of Congress receive? Right, right. well, you know what, I, I, it, it, so this is, a, this is a big issue, right? We, we, live in a, we live in a time where so many people face health care insecurity, and people face rising costs, so I, you know, I, I don't think that members of Congress should, you know, should have Cadillac plans particularly forever. <laughs> um, I, I do strongly support term limits for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I, too, too, many, too many members of Congress, they think that their positions belong to them. At the end of the day, they belong to the people. 
they belong to the people. So I, I think that you know Amer Americans, they are looking for change. They don't want to see career politicians who are holding office for too long and forgetting why they ran and why they were elected in the first place. I would like to uh, end the, the discussion here. We had scheduled it for, for an hour, so we went to, you know, a little bit over, which is certainly okay. Um, I want to thank you and the audience for coming, for asking questions, and of course, I really want to say a big thank you to uh, Dan Cole for, for being here tonight. As I had mentioned uh, earlier, uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the influence of, uh, of dark money and, uh, and, and that process, please join us on October 30th at 5 p.m. in the Commons uh, Heritage Room. It'll be, it'll be upstairs, so you, uh, have a good night. All right, thank you everyone very much.